Shalom and welcome to another edition here on the Genesis 49ers page where we say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. Today's topic is going to be on West Africa and Judaic attributes as well as black Jews that were slaves and people knew they descended as Jews because there's a claim out there that we have no proof that Jews, that black slaves, are black African slaves, if you will, claim to be Jews or said they were Jews or kept the custom, which is a fallacy, and they know it, and they just try to make an argument because every other argument they make gets crushed, so they think, oh, we finally got something. So we're going to address that as well on this video. We're also going to show a few migration migration um, historic records about Jews coming from the, uh, the Israel area, Egypt, and going into West Africa. I showed that in my last video, Refuting Garfield, and I was going to make another one because he challenged me three times to debate him, but he was just being a troll and being wicked. So I'm not into debating. I don't want to debate. I'm just here to give lectures and provide the information. That's what I'm here to do. So let's get right into it, brothers and sisters. Thanks for supporting the channel. The subscriber, subscriber count is rising and rising and rising. I think we're at 400 some subscribers. I'm getting consistent views. So we're going to make more and more videos. I know this video in particular took a while because I want to take my time and construct it well so you guys can have the best experience possible that I can give you regarding this topic. So let's get to the first slide. First slide, Yehudi. Uh, the first subject I want to touch on, the same subject I touched on my last video, is to illustrate these black Jews still exist in Africa and also in the Americas. So with that being stated, we're going to touch on a few sources and bring out that information. So this is from the Travels in North Africa by Nahum Sluch, page 135. I will be quoting a lot of his work within this within this presentation. And to the right, we're dealing with the uh, Rabbi of the Caves of Tigrinia, right? Which is in Africa. And he's expressing his experience of being amongst these different Jews that surround the Garian area, right? And he gives their phenotype and how they look physically. He explains how they look physically, right? So we go get right into it. It says, Meanwhile, we proceeded to the underground home of the Rabbi of the Caves. His wife welcomed us respectfully and brought us the inevitable draught of logby, date juice, which refreshed us. Men were scarce, nearly all of them were at the market, but the news of our arrival having spread even as far as the marketplace, the foremost citizens hurried back to bring us a brotherly salon. Less than an hour after my arrival, there were already more than a dozen of my co-religionists, meaning other Jews, returned from the market because Nehu Slush was a Ashkenazi Jew that was traveling North Africa to, to, to visit these other different Jews that he was informed of. So, he says, uh, that a dozen of my co-religionists returned from the market, all of a fine, dark type. All of a fine, dark type. They surrounded us. So he's saying these men are black. These Jews in the Guardian area okay of the sahara right they are of the fine dark type these are all dark skinned people okay he's respecting them as being jews he's not saying they're not jews because they're black he's just saying these jews are black and he's representing and he's respecting that they surrounded us and poured forth all their troubles and all the details of their life. I was informed that our host, Rabbi Halifa, who was still absent, was descended from a family of physicians and rabbis which immigrated from Morocco more than seven centuries ago. That one of his ancestors had even succeeded in the days when the Jews were still numerous in these parts and rising to the headship of Jabal Guardian. They showed me in the distance a Kassar of Tigrana, 
dominating the village and bearing inscriptions in Hebrew and in Arabic, which testify to the curious fact of the Jewish supremacy in the Garion. They told me further that Halifa had never taken any course in medicine or in all his knowledge to his ancestors and to the manuscript treaties in Hebrew and Arabic. Why Arabic? Because we know Islam, the Islamic faith of different Arabs came and swept uh, Africa. Just like a lot of our, this video is in English, the, my, my sources are written in English. Why? Because English is the lingua franca of the world right now. Because people that spoke English and chose English conquered it, right? Conquered America, North America, uh, Britain. Okay, so duh, the language is going to be English. Just like back then, the language that they dealt with was Arabic. Now, we're dealing with the next source from the same, same guy, Nahum Sluice, page 145, Travels in North Africa. It says, Haven't met them, but he assured me that there exists, exists at least in the East Sudan a black skinned population with some called the Felici, and which are generally known among the Taregs as the Crit. They observe the Sabbath and are known to be of Jewish origin. Now, people that hate the fact that we come from Jews and Israelites will say, oh, they converted, they converted. Again, he never hints to the fact that they converted as in the sense that you think. Because when you say they converted, you're saying they're not blood Jews. They're not pedigree Jews, but they're religious Jews, which is far from the truth. And we're going to get to the nitty gritty and we're going to break down everything in regards to that to show you that these are legitimate Jews. Next slide. Jewish Negroes. The Reverend Dr. Philip, missionary in North Africa, gives the following details concerning that country. A Russian Jew resident at Meda gave him information concerning a great number of Israelites inhabiting the oasis of the Sahara and dwelling also at Bator, Bisrabi, Takarat, Bosada, Bien Usab, Lokas, etc. There are in each of these places as many as a hundred families. And in some even more. Right? So this was in the 1800s and he was observing this. In one place he found 600 families with numerous synagogues. And about 100 copies of the law written upon parchment. Some of which were more ancient than he had ever seen. But this is not all. Other curious details reached Dr. Philip from another source. A Jew who had accompanied a German traveler as far as Timbuktu found near the boundary of the kingdom of Bambara a large number of Jewish Negroes. Nearly every family among them possessed the law of Moses written upon parchment. Although they speak of the prophets, they have not their writings. Their prayer, so they, they have the Torah, but they don't have the Tanakh. That's what it means. Although they speak of the prophets, they don't have their writings. They have the Torah or the Tarat as they call it. In the Arabic, they prayers differ from those of other Jews and are committed to little leaves of parchment stitched together and containing numerous passages derived from Psalms. These Jews mingled some of the superstition of the people around them. That's what it's going into. And this is from the International Society for Evangelize Evangelization of the Jews. Now, to know that these weren't Ashkenazi converts, as the label they try to put on anybody that's black, that has dark skin, you have to be a convert because you have been taught in this white supremacist society, that you, anything that has dark skin has to be African. African is nigger, and nigger is African. That's a Blumenbach teaching. So, if a black man says he's anything else than an African, then you're going to call him a liar, because you haven't thoroughly taught that black belongs to Africa and nowhere else. But guess what? We come from Evernati. We come from the Middle East. That's where we come from. That's our home. Our story starts in Arab Chaldees. It doesn't start in the land, the continent, Africa. Understand that. And we know Negro people belong there because the, the, the uh, some ancient Sumerian texts tell you about the black-headed people. Okay? And all you got to do is look at, look at the Assyrian. Okay? On the frescoes and the walls. They're p depicted with Negroid phenotypes. Dark skin. Kinky hair. All right, that, that's going to go into one of my lectures, which is going to be called Putting the Negro Back in Sumeria. Let's keep going. 
Bambara is clearly in West Africa within Mali, the Bambara of Mali. This is where those Jewish Negroes in the 1800s that uh, they, they, they met, that doctor, what was his name? Doctor, uh, Reverend Dr. Philip was referring to. Next. So now we, we're still dealing with color. We see no Jewish Negroes, dark skin, they all define dark skin. The crit had black skin. These are all Jews. Black skin, black people. Quote unquote, because we know skin color doesn't does not denote race. Stop making that error. Well, anyway, we have a papyri here. This is from a, a translation of a papyri, and it says Padocles, Pythocles, aged about, and then it skips that. And tall, dark, and it goes into his description: tall, dark colored skin, tall, dark colored skin. This is a Jew and it's stating that he had dark colored skin with deeply set eyes, a mole on the neck on the left side. So it was very meticulous with these accounts and descriptions of these Jews. Right? And that's from the Ptolemaic Papyri. Uh, the, the Petri Papyri. Dated back to 182 BCE as you can see on the screen. So all the way back then the Jews were black. That's why Tacitus said it's a saying that these people derive from Ethiopians. Atheops meaning burnt face. And that's from the beginnings of Jewishness by Shay J.D. Kohen, page 29. When he goes into the Ptolemaic papyri. And it also says they had honey color. Honey color is a brown hue. I have honey colored skin. A lot of our, a lot of our people, a lot of people that identify as African American have honey colored skin. Next slide. Here's another ancient, ancient by Xerxes, okay, that Josephus recorded what, Jer what Xerxes said about the Jews. It says, At the last there passed over a people wonderful to be beheld, for they spake the Phoenician tongue with their mouths. They dwelt in the Solomonian Mountains near a broad lake. Their heads were sooty. They had round razors on them. Their head and faces were like nasty horse heads also, that they had been hardened in smoke. You know, something hardened in smoke is what color? Black. He said their face was sooty, dark. This is from Xerxes. This is going all the way back to the 5th century B.C. And the source is Josephus against Apion, book 1, chapter 22. Now, that's... For the people that don't know what suiting means, suiting means covered with or colored like suit. Using names, look, the front of the fireplace was blackened and sooty. Using names of birds and other animals that are mainly blackish or brownish black. Sooty. So they were called sooty and i.e. sooty Ethiopians, meaning they were dark skinned. So the earliest accounts of the Jews and their physical description is going to go back to them having dark skin. Next, so we have Niger. It's not Niger. That's the English, British tongue speaking, but the Latin would be Niger because the I is to, pronounced like two E's, so it would be like Niger. So we have a few Jews that I'm going to show to exemplify my point, right, that these original Jews were Negroid. Now, you had Niger Perea. I don't know when he was born, but he was a Jewish military leader, okay, during the revolution. And his name was, and I said Niger, Niger or Niger of Perea. Okay, why? Because he had dark skin. He didn't call him that for no reason. Simon was called Niger. Acts 13 1. Why? He had dark skin. That's not a far fetched concept. David Dunn, David Dunn Negro in the 13th century. Okay, his family was called Negro. Okay, and amongst the Portuguese Jews, that was a surname, Negria, Negrigo. Why? Because these people had dark ancestry. They were black. Samuel Ibn Negrela. Negrela means little black ones. And he's a 10th century Jew. And to the right, we have, have the uh, Ethiopian Jewry stock. And they're authentic Jews as well. With ancient ties to Israel. Let's deal with the skin even more. It says, I myself saw two of them in Egypt. They are dark skin, and one could not tell whether they kept the teachings of the Karites 
or of the rabbis, for some of their practices resemble the Karite teaching, but on the other hand, other things, they appear to follow the instruction of the rabbis, and they say they are related to the tribe of Dan. As Obadiah ben, ben Abraham Bartanura, he wrote that in 1488. In the Wargla, oasis of Algeria, 350 miles from the Mediterranean, is a colony of Jews as black as Negroes. And that's Dr. Alan H. Godby. He especially blessed Shem and his sons black but comely, and he gave them the inhabitable earth. And that's from the Perky de Eleazar, a 9th century source. All these people are talking about the Jews having dark skin. Dark skin. The tradition is repeated in the 13th century by the Christian Ibn al Ibri Bahubreis, known for the fidelity with which he produced, reproduces early writers. Fidelity, which with which he reproduces early writers again in another work, Bar Hebrea speaks of Noah dividing the world, the world among his three sons, with Ham getting the land of the blacks, Sudan, Shem the land of the brown, Sumra, and Japheth the land of the red, Sukra. Because during his time, the 13th century, the Edomites had overrun Europe, which is usually was normally for Japheth. So he said that's the land of the red people. Those are what you would call Caucasians to this day, which that term was ter uh, coined by Blumenbach as well. But pay attention. Now, Shem was blessed black and comely according to the Perky de Eleazar as a 9th century, 8th century source, right? And then ben Bahu Breas, which was, which was a historian, a polyhistor, right? A Hebraic one at that. He said the Shem, Shem was the land of browns. He didn't say white or red people. He said they were, brown people stay there. Negroes, are we not brown? Are we not black, as you say? You can't go off that white supremacist view that everything that's black belongs in Africa and everything that's not is everywhere else. The source is Tariq Mutat Berut, 1890, reprinted 1983, page 15. Alright, Africa, the syntax error right there, correct it real quick, Africa. The author was in it, unable to distinguish a Jew from a, from a Muhammad while passing along the streets of Algiers, Constantine, and Tunis. Now I'm going to show you why he couldn't. It said, it is remarkable that among the non-Jewish natives, there are so many Jews of Negroid type showing a decided Negro infusion. This is the Jew by Maurice Fishberg, page 142-144, which came out in like 1906. He's giving you the truth about these Jews. Because a lot of people are saying, you're saying the Jews is black natives in Africa. Where are they now? There's plenty of black Jews there. Ismael Hiadara is one of them. And I talk about him in a lot of my videos because he has the records to prove that he descends from the Abana family, which are a group of Levites. It's in the Fondokati library. They weren't converts. They were born as Jews. And that's another thing, too. If you was not born of two parents, you couldn't have a, a, a cemetery. You couldn't have a graveyard. You couldn't be buried in a Jewish graveyard if you weren't born of two Jew parents. That was a rule in Amsterdam and other various Sephardic areas. So why do if they were converted, as you say, why are they being why are Jewish Negroes being allowed to be buried in these cemeteries? We wouldn't find it if they were just all converts, as some people postulate. Safari, so here we go again. Uh, and in fact, even Spanish and Portuguese Jews, the Sephardim, who have been considered to be much of a darker complexion than the Eastern European Drew Jews, which is these Ashkenazi people, the Ashkenazim, also have a fair number of blondes among them, as can be seen from the following figures. Because a lot of us mixed with a lot of white people and white people invaded our culture and took things and took over. But he's honest about the fact that they're normally dark people swarthy people and this is from the jew by maurice fishberg page 65 
tipo, meaning type in Spanish. It says the Negroid type among Jews is yet to be mentioned. One occasionally meets with a Jew whose skin is very dark. Let me read that again. One occasionally, meaning what? This happens a lot. This is not a rare occurrence. He said one occasionally meets with a Jew whose skin is very dark. The hair black and woolly. The head long with a prominent occiput. And this is so apropos to the ancient Jews because this is the same phenotype they had. We read what the king uh, Xerxes had to say about them. He said they were Sudi. It says the face is prognathias. The two jaws are projecting in the form of a muzzle. The lips are large, thick, and upturned, and the nose flat, broad, and the wings upturned so that the nostril can be seen in profile. This Negro type can be singled out in any large assembly of Jews. They are often mistaken for mulattoes, and the author knows of one who had a considerable, considerable difficulty to get along in one of the southern states of America. That was a black Jew in the southern states of America that he knew of. And it wasn't no convert, as y'all try to say. This was a Jew born as a Jew. A pedigree Jew. Maurice Fishberg, page 120. So that kills, oh, where are the Jews at over here? Coming off slave ships, where are they? That's one right there. He mentioned to by Maurice Fishberg. And we're going to keep going. There's more. St. Saint, Saint Jerome said, born in first instance, we are naturally black. What does it mean to be naturally black? I mean, by nature, you are you have melanin. And St. Jerome said that. So what that let you know about St. Jerome? That he was black. Okay? And most of his audience could have been black. Because he says, we. Who was the we? Is that the other clergyman? Most likely. Because if you see the ancient pictures and depiction that you have within the Russian icons, majority of them are dark. And the source I got that from is letter 23 of Jerome to Estuchium. Estuchium. Right? So next slide. And this is what my channel, we, we're here to provide you with sources to defend the gospel, defend the faith, defend our race and our nationality. Because every day you have some European or an Apion, right, that's trying to go against who they are and who we are. And tear it down and bring us back to square one. We're not going back to square one. We're going to continue to grow and rise as a nation. Now, this is Russia. It says that the Tsarist officials frequently listed as Negroes, frequently listed Negroes as Arabs and Jews. And that source, Africans in Russia by Leah Golden Hunger, page 10. Why would they... Why would they say the Negro? I thought all Jews were white. I thought the real Jews were white. They said they frequently listed Negroes as Arabs and Jews. That's according to the Russian officials in the early 19th century. And to the right, we have a depiction of Saint Nikolai. Right? What color is he? I'll let you figure that out. Spinoza. This is about Baruch Spinoza. He was a Jew born, I believe, in the 17th century. And he was born in Amsterdam. And he was uh, basically excommunicated by the Jewish community. Right? He became a Christian. But we, we have his physical description on record. And it says he was middle-sized. He had good features in his face. The skin somewhat black. Now, somewhat black... That means he's brown or dark-ish, okay? You can't get a white man out of somewhat black. There's nothing, there, there's no melanin, there's little to no melanin in white people. So this can't be talking about a Caucasian. This is talking about someone that exhibits melanin in their skin. And the source is The Jew by Jacob Radar Marcus, page 386. To the right, we have more black imagery. Next slide. Now, we, we dealt with the skin complexion and the records bearing witness to black Jews, Negroid Jews, right? Ancient, modern, okay? We went to 18, 19, 14th century, 12th century, 9th century, 3rd century, and we went to the B.C. periods. 2nd century B.C., then we went all the way about 5th century B.C., they all said they were black. 
How many more witnesses do we need until you, until you brothers realize who you are? Now, we're going to deal with the migrations, right? The history about Jews migrating. And this is not all of it. I got like 30-something slides here. But this is not going to cover every aspect. This is just to give you brothers and sisters some tools of, and, of knowledge and wisdom so you can build upon your faith and to build upon of who you build upon your nationality. Because we got to be able to, we, we can't, we can't just talk it. We got to walk it, man. You got to be able to prove yourself. You can't let these people run all over you. Now, this is Travels in North Africa by Nahum Sluch, page 344. It says, and it is not at all surprising to encounter in every part of a desert, of the desert, traces and even survivals of a primitive Juda Judaism. And don't be, real quick, sidebar, don't be afraid to use the term Judaism. Ism means a system. Judah means the system of Judah. The system of the Jews. Judah, Judaism. We are following the system of the Jews. That's it. There's not a negative term. Don't be afraid of it. It says, which at one time played an important role in the whole region of, of the Sahara from the Senegal to the very borders of Somaliland, in which even in our day has been a help in the French occupation. The oral traditions which are everywhere found concerning the early Jewish history, not some places, not minute, not small, not insignificant, but he's saying that the oral traditions is everywhere around Africa about these Jews coming in and having societies. It says, the oral traditions which are everywhere found concerning the early Jewish his history of this country are beginning to find confirmation in Arab writings and even in inscriptions of Jewish origin. We are beginning to learn now a, of a great migration. In the time of Muhammad or even before in the famous year of the elephant, many Jews were forced into Arab Ar Arabia. We are told of the Yahud Shabbat, the Rakab. A tribe of shepherds and agriculturalists and intrepid horsemen who at one time camped on the shores of the Red Sea and who finally crossed the Sudan and penetrated to the farthest point, uh, points of the Sahara, meaning West Africa. That's in the records. Jews coming from the Red Sea area, okay, and going all the way into West Africa. Okay, it says to them, the Moorish natives, as well as the Arabs and Negroes, attribute the founding of the first empires, the erection of the first public buildings in the country. So they attribute these things to these Jews. The construction of the first canals and irrigation systems and the institution of a social and economic regime, which still survives in all Saharan communities. So they give props to these Jews that came. Okay. And the year of the elephant was the 5th century A.D. This is what he's making reference to. All right, now here it goes um, from the affairs. that read the source? Yeah. They, Travels in North Africa by Nahum Sluice, page 344. Next slide is going to be the affairs of West Africa by Edmund Denis Morel. Page 150. It says, it's, it is significant that the son and successor of Othman Don Folio, Sultan Bayo of Hausa, second Fulani ruler over the Hausa states in the history of Sudan, written in Arabic characters, which he gave the Calabritan described the, to the Torus, who may, I think, be identified with Torados, a sect of Fulani greatly looked up to as having originated from the Jews. Mungo Park, when writing of his experience among the Mandigos, who appeared to have been converted to Islam by the Fulani, with whom they had been in close relationship, amiable in the reverse for many centuries, exerted a similar widespread knowledge of the incidents in the Old Testament history, such as the death of Abel, the lives of the patriarchs, Joseph's dream, and so on, went to bottom as equally emphatic. The custom of these people, the Fulani, he says, bear a striking resemblance to those of the Jews described in the Pentateuch and after Muhammad. Moses is held by them in the highest estimation. 
There is some uniformity, too, between the following descriptive passages. The first is from the Kenrick American Edition. The second from the Lyings history of the Sulima people and their relations with the Fulani. So we can see the Fulanis that in their histories they have a tie to the Jews. Okay. So next slide. All right, let's deal with it. Pedigree. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, read from the left to the right. It says Hebrewisms in Jamaica. Now, as gardening observes even today in Jamaica, the descendants of the old slaves retain a practice that a room in which person dies shall not be swept or disturbed for nine days. Water and other requir requisites are placed in it, in it, in it, and as among the Jews. A light is kept burning during the prescribed period. Gardner, however, is an error when he positively asserts that this is a practice, that this practice is not of African origin. So let's go to Haiti now. As a matter of fact, Hebrewism of African de de derivation are not confined to Jamaica. Among the West Indian islands, Blur Niles in her recent delightful little volume, Black Haiti, speaking of slaves from Africa, positively asserts what does it mean to positively assert something? Meaning you have confidence in what you're going to say because you know what you're going to say is true. Now, this sister wrote in here that some were said about the African slaves, right? The slaves from Africa. Some were said to be descendants of Jews. Some were said to be descendants of Jews. Some were said to be descendants of Jews. Because you have a group of ignorant necros. And I'm not going to say negroes. Necros. Because they're dead. Okay? They're spiritually and, uh, and intellectually and scholastically dead. They're necros. Saying that, oh, can we find some Jews that, that, that came off the ship? Here you go. Some were said to be descendants of Jews mixed with Negroes. Because they, again, in their mind, they're thinking, oh, Jew is white. But it says, mixed with Negroes to attest to their dark skin, right? Even though we know the original Jews were dark. These were tall well-built man whose features had a Caucasian cast and whose language was clearly Semitic in character. So they had a Semitic language or Semitic-like language and they were said to be descendants of Jews. Slaves. These are African slaves going to Haiti. Dr. Price Mars, whom she quotes as an authority, also claims a distant Semitic infiltration in the antecedents of some of the San Domingo slaves. So we had Jamaica, Haiti, and Santo Domingo, all three exhibiting that these slaves had uh, features and characteristics and attributes of Jews and even said to be descendants of Jews. And that's from Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph J. Williams, page 14 to 15. Let's deal with it. Here we go, Jamaica. Many of the Jews who were banished from Portugal by John II settled in the West Indies. John Bigelow, who visited Jamaica in 1850, saw the descendants of these Jews and says that they were Negroid. Source, Nature Knows No Color Line, pages 123 and 130. To the right, we have Sher Shalom, where you have a lot of black Jews there. But you also have white Jews. and now, Some of them are, are uh, Orthodox Jews. We understand that. But... The main guy, I can't think of his name right now, he brought up that there's over 424,000 Jews in Jamaica. And he said these are not converted Jews. These are simply Jews going back to their root, their Sephardic roots, by that, by that, that I might add. Right? And 200,000, we know 200,000 of those are Negroid. Okay? And he says, and the white man says, no, these are not people just simply converting. These are not Negroes just simply converting. These are Jews coming back to their roots. Something to ponder on. We all know about Israel Hill. A lot of people are going to say all oh, those just converts too, but we're going to bring it up. And Slava, which was slave comes from, means glory. Okay? It took a negative connotation over the years. But nonetheless, let's get into it. The free blacks of Israel Hill. 
just to of the west lines Israel Hill settled in 1810 and 11, 1811 by approximately 90 formerly enslaved persons who received freedom in 350 acres from Judith Randolph, which would be a Jewish person. Under the will of her husband, Richard Randolph, cousin of Thomas Jefferson, these Israelites and other free African Americans worked as farmers, craftspeople, and approximate river boatmen. Some labored alongside whites for equal wages and defended their rights in court. The family of the early settlers, Hercules White, brought and sold real estate in Formville and joined with the white citizens to found the town's first Baptist church in 1836. Israel Hill remained a vigorous black community into the 20th century. And that's Formville, Virginia, where you can find that monument. Next slide. So we're going to go into West Africa again. We're going to deal with Yehudi, the Sudanese Jews, and we're going to bring up Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph J. Williams, pages 64 and 65. Later, while criticizing a map that had been published by T. Edward Bowditch in 1819, he says, beginning then at the top of the map, I find a place called Yehudi, a country or town of non-existence. Yehudi simply implies Jews. The, tribe, the tribes of the Jews, etc., which termed the Muslims apply to those people of the Mosaic faith who inhabit the lower Atlas and the districts of Susi. They also apply the term Yehudi to the Hebrew or Jewish tribes, whether native Africans or not, who inhabit Maroa, some parts of Filoni. Filoni is what you call Fulani. Okay? So they would recognize these Fulani people as Jews, Yehudis. In the neighborhood of Timbuktu, of these people, I imagine the author of the information spoke when he endeavored to make Mr. Bowditch comprehend the import of the word Yehudi. As a nation of or a tribe, they cannot be inserted with prop propriety in any map, for they exist even in a more deplorable state of servitude and humiliation in those districts than in the Empire of Morocco. Why? Because the Islamic persecution was going against the Yehudi, okay, which are the Jews of West Africa. In passing, it should be remarked that whenever it is at all possible, Dupius takes exception to the statements of Bowditch and aligns himself against his predecessor's views. It should also be remembered that Dupius is drawing his information for the most part from the Moors, while Bowditch records the traditions of the Ashanti themselves. And that's what he recorded. They told him, hey, the Yehudi lived there. The Yehudi lived there. The Jews lived there. In the present instance, however, Bowditch would appear to have... the the better claim for credibility as only six years after the republication of Dupi's criticism, it was emphatically refuted by two travelers who actually passed along nigger and entered in the journal, entered their journal under the date of Wednesday, July 7, 1830. Yahudi is a large flourishing and united kingdom. It is bounded on the east by Hausa on the west Burgo and the north by Kubi and on the south by the kingdom of Nofi. So we know this in West Africa. And they, they was, they're showing, pro, showing and proving that there was a kingdom called Yahudi in West Africa. The position indicated by the travelers on the map were placed on the Nigger River, river about midway between the present Busan, Gambia, and northern Nigeria. But let us return to Dupius narrative where we read the Jews of Sudan are, according to my informant, divided into large and small tribes with whose names they are unacquainted. Their mode of life in some country is pastoral. Because you have somebody saying, they were all traitors. They were all traitors. That's not true. You had Jews, Yehudi, in West Africa that were pastoral and just dealt with ag agriculture. Okay? But the towns are filled with traitors and artificers of, the, of that faith. So you have traitors and you have pastoral Jews. Not just one. Who gain a su subsistence at their survival at several excuse me, several employments in the service of the Muslims under whose government they live as vassals. This in reference to Mr. Bolt, Bolt, which kingdom of Yehudi, I may permit it to say, is the only state of society in which that oppressed nation is suffered to live in the tribes without security in their possessions, without public revenues of arms, are hourly exposed to insult and rapine from the blind zeal and act of bigotry by which their lords are animated in these countries. The lands occupied by these people cover a wide extent between Masina and Kabi. They are said to be mingled also with the upper Fu the Fula, Fulaha tribes, eastward of Timbuktu, which is the Fuli, the Fulani. 
And in many parts of Maroa, they have inherited uh, are are employed as artificers in the cities and towns as we live among the heathen, said Bashaw. So do the Jews in Maroa in villainy with our brethren, which villainy against Fulani. But they are not esteemed like us, for they are a people hardened in their sins and obstinate in infidelity. The anger of God is upon them, and therefore, therefore are they given to the rule of the Muslims until they shall be incorporated with the faithful. The tribes are not black, meaning they're not dark, 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 but of a color resembling the Arabs of the north, which the Mohammedans were Negro as well. We read that earlier, according to Maurice Fishberg. But what is more material, these Sudanic Jews are reported to have been the original inhabitants thereabout after the Arabs were acquainted with Central Africa. I'm going to read it again. These Sudanic Jews, the Yehudi, are reported to have been the original inhabitants. What do you mean, Jew? You got those same necros coming against the truth are saying that there were no Jews in West Africa before the Portuguese. But everybody that lives in West Africa, all the historians are attesting to that the Jews were the early inhabitants and they built West Africa and many of these cities in West Africa. Let me put it like that. So it says these Sudanic Jews are reported to have been the original inhabitants there about after the Arabs were acquainted with Central Africa. But then it says whence came these Jews and what influence did they exert, if any, upon the Ashanti and bygone days? So, that's Hebrewisms of West Africa, a good book. If you haven't purchased it yet, you should add this to your collection. And we just brought out the Yehudi being in West Africa. So, if anybody ever tell you Jews were never in West Africa, here's the primary source to crush them. All right? And also build somebody up. You can show a brother, hey, we were in West Africa. Here's the proof. Those those, a lot of those people that was being subjugated, the Fulani, okay, the Ashanti, subjugated and sold in slavery, we have the proof that they have Hebraic and Judaic ties. Here's the map, West African map, where you see Yehudi right there along the river, just above Bambara. You see that? And I want to just take a time, time out to... Thank everybody that has subscribed and, you know, give praise to the Most High. Because I know it takes me a little, bit, a little bit to, you know, make these videos, all these slides, and try to make it as congruent and uh, have it with fluency, confluency as, as much as possible to make this thing run smoothly. So the viewer, you brothers at home, you sisters at home can get this information and not just receive it, but also absorb this information. Still with Passage, Passage. Travels in North Africa by Nahum Slutz again. I told you, brothers and sisters, that I was going to go back to this source a, mul a, a multitude of times. Page 346. It says, um, In the Sahara, the Jews have left the most distinct traces. Not only Arab, but also Jewish authors of the 10th century speak of the existence of Jewish groups, no doubt autonomous to the south of Fez. Among other, Abraham ibn Ezra speaks as follows of the heretical Jews of Wagala. Exodus 12 and 2, second commentary. The heretics of Wagala celebrate their Passover in the following fashion. These misled people all leave their country on the 15th of, the, of Nisan to celebrate the festival in the desert, as did Israelites under Moses. These Jews are mentioned as heretics by various rabbis until the 16th century. So they knew of these Jews in Warkala, which is in, which is in uh, West Africa. Right? So, and that's a 10th century source, by the way. That's scholarship, by the way. Meli, right? We're going to deal with Meli. And this is from Universal Ge Geography by Conrad Monte Brun, page 252. It says, according to another passage, these white people beyond the Great Lake is called by the Arabs Nazareth, we Christians or Christian Nazarites. They are distinguishable from the tribe of Jews who live on the frontier of Lam or Meli. So he said, we white people are distinguishable from, a tr from the tribe of Jews. Why? Because these Jews have melanin. <laughs> How about that? These are brown and dark people. 
This account acquires some importance when we compare it with the testimony of Edrisi, who expressly places the Jews in Limlim, in which Leo Africanus calls Meli, from the city of Malel. These Jews are very probably traveling merchants known for a country back on the slave coast under the name of Malis or Malays. For though circumcised, these merchants neither abstain from wine nor other strong liquors. They selected and killed with their own hands the animals whose flesh they ate. They came from a country to the north of Guyana, rich in gold, copper, and precious stones. So we have Jews in West Africa, and also they were easily distinguishable from these white people, okay, or white Christians. For the record, let's get this get this back on the record again. From the Jews of North Africa by Sir Carleen. Page four. I brought this out in my last video, bring it out again. According to St. Jerome under the Pax Romana, the Jewish communities underwent a period of great prosperity all the way from India to the western tip of Africa. Their numbers were bolstered as well by the 30,000 Jews that Titus, a prominent general prior to becoming Roman emperor from 79 to 81 had deported from Israel to North Africa after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the second temple in 70. By this time, there were scattered all over North Africa a large number of Jewish communities who had taken refuge there or who, according to Josephus, had been enslaved and sub subsequently redeemed by the co-religionists. The Jews built synagogues and elected leaders who strove to endow the community with a strong and efficient foundation. This chain of events occurred once again following Bar Kova insurrection from 132 to 135. The failure of his revolt led directly to the expulsion of the Jews of Israel, who had also been enslaved and redeemed by the North African brethren. The Romans were sometimes tolerant towards their Jewish and Berber subjects, and sometimes quite cruel. The massacre of millions of Jews in Judea by Titus in 70 AD during and following the siege of Jerusalem triggered many rebellions in the ultra-religious Jewish community of Cyrenica, which, according to Josephus, numbered over 500,000 people. These rebellions were repressed so harshly that the Jews were almost completely exterminated. Weakened, embittered, and overwhelmed by the inhumanity of such a rule, the Jews drifted away from Rome and moved closer to the Berbers, meaning the western tip of Africa. Okay, that's why in the beginning it says the Jewish communities underwent a period of great prosperity all the way from India to the western tip of Africa. And that's attested by St. Jerome, which lived in the 4th century AD. So we know you have Jews of antiquity in the West Africa. The biblical record. The biblical record. We can't forget about the biblical narrative. Does not Sephaniah 3 and 10 said for from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughters of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. That's going towards West Africa. Now, before anybody say, oh, that's that was added or that's inflated, that's in the Wadi Murat Ba'at Minor, okay, Dead Sea Strolls, Prophets, Estant. Verses 1 through 6 and 8 through 20 are found in the Dead Sea Strolls, which date back to the 2nd century BC. So that's ancient source. That's an ancient source material right there, showing Africans moving into the western parts of, I mean, Jews moving into the western part of Africa. Right? So, next slide. Zua. According to records such as Tariq al Sudan, the first recorded Jewish president may have emerged in West Africa with the arrival of the first Zua ruler of Kukia and his brother located near the Niger River. He was known only as Zua Alaman, meaning he comes from Yemen. Some local legends state that Zua Alaman was a member of one of the Jewish communities that were either transported or voluntarily moved from Yemen by the Ethiopians in the 6th century CE after the defeat of Dunuaz. The Tariq al Sudan states that there were 14 Zuwa rulers of Kukia after Zuwa Aleman before the rise of Islam in the region, which was very Judaic in nature. We know that. And this is Tariq al Sudan by Adderrahman ben Abdal es Sadi, page 5 through 10. So we can find the information. Moving on. So we continue to prove 
the validity of the claims of ancient Judaic tribes in West Africa. We proved that they were dark skinned, okay, and Negroid, right? So we have the Kati, the Fundo Kati. Fundo Kati, which opened in 2003 with funding from the Spanish government, defends the memory of the Andalusian history and sites in Timbuktu and the rest of Africa. To date, Fundo Kati has recorded 4,449 descendants of the prominent Al Andalusian Kati family. Who are the Kati? The Kohaf family. The people of Kohaf, which come from Levi. There's over 4,000 descendants in Timbuktu. These black people have the records. They have the records. They have it on paper. That they descend from Israelites. You can't argue against that. Ancient records stating that these dark skinned Jews are in fact Israelites. One of them being Ismael. He a daughter. The organization maintains a library of 12,714 Muslim, Jewish, and Christian manuscripts ranging from the year 1198 to 1893, as well as 22,000 pieces of African art dating from the first millennium BC to the 19th century. Now, I got this information from the site of consciousness. Fano Kati, Calle La Rey de San Matias, Granada, Spain. All right. Let's continue on. We quoted this earlier, Mungo Park's Travel in Africa. Right? And he I think I believe this is the eighteenth century when he wrote this and he made this voyage. It says it says, uh, I discovered that Negroes are in possession among others of an Arabic version of the Pentateuch of Moses, which they call the Tareta La Musa. This is so highly esteemed that it's often sold for the value of one prime slave. They have likewise a version of the Psalms of David and lastly the book of Isaiah, which they call Ling Lingelia La Isa, and it is in a very high, high esteem. I suspect indeed that in all these copies there are an interpolation of some of the peculiar tenets of Muhammad. For I could distinguish in many passages the name of the prophet. It is possible, however, that, that this circumstance might otherwise have been accounted for if my knowledge of the Arabic had been more extensive. By means of those books, many converted Negroes, why does it say converted Negroes? Because they were converted to Islam. Have acquired an acquaintance with some of the remarkable events of the Old Testament. They counted our first parents, the death of Abel, the Diluze, the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the story of Joseph and his brethren. The history of Moses, David, Solomon, and all these have been related to me in the Mandingo language with tolerable exactness by different people. And my surprise was not greater on hearing these accounts from the lips of Negroes. Why? Because a lot of our people were converting, but they were still Judaic in nature and they still had the Judaic literature. And that's what he's attesting to. Then there are on finding that I was already acquainted with them, for although the Negroes in general have a thereon a schoolmaster possessed a variety, a variety of manuscripts which had partly been purchased from the trading of Moors and partly borrowed from the Bushreens in the neighborhood and copies with great care. Other MSS have been produced to me at different places of other, of, in the course of my journey and on recounting those I had before seen and those which were now shown to me in interrogating the schoolmaster on the subject. I discovered that the Negroes are in possession among others, of the Arabic versions. And I just repeated that. This should be a different page. But we're going to let it rock. Let's get to the next one. Arapi. Maybe in a future video, I will show you page 307. Arapi, it says, And the journey was usually performed upon bullocks. He said there were many Jews at Timbuktu, but they all spoke Arabic and used the same prayers as the Moors. And I want them point this out in Mungo Park's travel in Africa, page 137, to show you that a lot of them were already converted into Islamic, the Islamic faith, but you can still tell that it, they were Jews. And that's what he was account, encountering in Africa. Now, I want to address on this slide the Kohen, because it was made by another necro, a dead person. Another statement was made by the ignorance of someone Stating that, oh, there's new new studies saying that Kohen was not a Jewish convert or she wasn't a Jew. First of all, she's not a Jewish convert, and yes, she is a Jew. 
Travels in North Africa by Nahum Sluice, page 309. We're going to go into the history. As I have shown elsewhere, the criminal Ju Judaism was dominated by the families of priests. The Kahina, their queen herself, a priestess and the daughter of a Kohen. That's what the word Kohina means. So she is a Levite. Not a convert. She's born a Jew. It is the history of this queen which has never been treated in any Jewish work that I am I'm about to relate. For while traveling in her country, I was able to ascertain the great role which she played. We are dealing now with a legendary, but with a real historic character. Her history has been related by the Arab writers Ibn Khaldun and Navari, etc. The Jairua, a warrior tribe which immigrated after the Saranica massacres of 115-118. So these are Jews that immigrated after the, the wars, okay, the revolts. They immigrated into these areas of Africa after the Cyrenicas, after the Jews of Cyrenica fought in 115-118. Generally pitched their tents on the Jebel Menachor, a long hill stretching in the north of Cancella, and dominated the vast plains of Arraticus, which the Wed Nini splits in two. Their territory, which extended as far as the Jebel, where a Jewish cemetery may still be seen, had its capital at Bagaya. So what are their origins? These are real Jews going back to those Jews that were fighting against the Roman government. These are not converts. By the side of the Roman and Berber ruins in the city, I found a necropolis resembling that of Gamat. At the two extremities of the country of the Jerua, I found two other cemeteries. Toward the 5th century, pro providing by the help which they had been given by the Vandals, given the Vandals, the Jerua gained a firm hold on the country of Ares. The historian Ibn Kadun tells us that by the military strength, their knowledge of the arts of peace and their nobility, the Jerua dominated all the Berbers of the middle country, supplying them with royal dynasties. So these were Jews, Jews, Jews ruling this area, not converts, natural born Jews. And they can test to it by the hist history of the 5th century. We're going to get to it. All right? Because Justinian, he made a law in the 5th century against these Jews, which attested them being there. Okay? And with that, we're going to go to the final, the final slide, which I have two maps, and this is extra. Showing jewelry in the West African maps. To the left, you see exiled Hebrews found in Shankala, by DMville, Africa, 1747. What does that say? Jews exiled. Falashem. And that's what Falasha means, to be exiled. The wandering charms. To the right, we know about the Jews in Africa, 1747, the kingdom of Judah. And the Bight of Bonin. Now, people are going to say, why do we, and this mean bird or whatever. It's kingdom of Judah. You can't change it just because... You know, you hate the information and you hate the primary sources and you don't want to admit it. You just don't want to admit that we are the Israelites that the Bible speaks of. And we have the proof. With that, I'm going to end. I pray that this was a very edifying lecture, presentation. I pray you brothers and sisters, if you haven't subscribed, you subscribe. If you agree, comment below. If you disagree, disagree respectfully below. Leave your comments. Like the video, share it on the social media platforms. Let's get our videos out there, man. Let's support Hebraic channels. Let's support them, okay? Support support Maccabees TV. Support Kingdom Harbinger Ministries. Support these channels. Support Sakari, okay? We need to bring all of our viewership back to our Hebrew channels. It's just that simple. Non-Hebraic channels get more views than us. But we have Hebrew people on there supporting and being proponents of their re regime. So we need to bring that back to our channels. Okay? And if I left out a channel, I'm sorry. Comment it below. That needs, to, that needs to, you know, our love and our support. Comment below. Michael Edwards, he has a good channel. You know? There's plenty of Hebraic channels out there. That's support then. Let's get that viewership up, brothers. With that, I'm going to say Shalom. Genesis 49ers signing off.